And so they too pick up this chorus of praise. And while they do say hallelujah, right, prior to that, they say amen or amen, depending on where you're from. What does amen mean or amen? So be it, I agree with it, right? Here too, another Hebrew word that was transliterated into the Greek, right? And so if you look at the Greek, it's amen, you know, alpha, mu, um, eta, nu, right? Amen. Uh, and so when they translated into English, they still didn't know what to do with it, so they made it amen. And that's where we get the word amen. But the idea behind it is, so be it, may it be, it is signifying agreement with what has been said. And so they, the, the 24 elders have been hearing what the great multitude has said, and they're, they're agreeing with it. May it be, play, praise the Lord. I mean, this is absolutely right. Give God praise because it's right. And so their message, their, um, their praise is to kind of affirm what has been said before. But they're, they're not the only ones talking in heaven. From the throne comes a voice. And the voice says, Praise our God, all you his servants, all who fear him, small and great. Whose voice is this? Is it Jesus? I mean, in previous times we've heard voices from the throne, and... It's been God's voice, but it doesn't seem to fit. So, is it Jesus? Um, other people have suggested, um, you know, maybe the angelic beings uh, or the 24 elders who are around the throne. Maybe the Holy Spirit. Now, certainly we've seen God on the throne. We've not really seen Jesus on the throne here in, in Revelation. Um, but certainly Jesus deserves to be on the throne. Now, some would say, no, it's not Christ's voice, because they would say, well, wouldn't we say, my God, praise my God, instead of our God? Well, I don't know that that necessarily, I mean, I can see what they're trying to say, but I don't know that that, that would necessarily hold up, because there are passages in Scripture where Christ identifies with the saints. Right? For example, in the, in the book of Hebrews, he talks about them being his brothers and sisters. Right? And so God is just as much their God and his God together. And so saying our God could make sense. Now, is it possible that it's the actual throne speaking? It's a voice coming from the throne. You know, in John the Baptist, when John the Baptist um, is confronted with the Pharisees early on in his ministry, um, he tells them, "Don't think of you. Don't think you're so great because you're children of Abraham. God is able to raise up from these stones children of Abraham." Jesus, in response to the Pharisees in the triumphal entry, uh, the Pharisees tell him, "You know, to tell your followers to be quiet." And Jesus says, if these were silent, right, these people that are praising him, these were silent, the rocks would cry out. Now, in both of those cases, I think it's hyperbole, but this is apocalyptic literature, right? You know, so we don't have to have, sometimes hyperbole is what makes sense. Um, so is it the throne actually speaking? We've heard voices from the altar and some other things. Um, maybe. I, I think it's probably more likely that it's, it's Christ's voice, or, or something like that. Um, but ultimately, even though we can't pinpoint the specific speaker, what's important here is, is not the origin of the voice as, the, as it is the content. And so there is a call for all saints now to be involved in the praise. Okay. All those who fear him, small and great. Because right? the, the first praise had been from the heavenly multitude. The second praise was from the 24th uh, elders, and now the call is for everybody else. Right? Everybody else, it's time to join in. If you fear God, join in this praise. And so John hears another voice, the voice of a great multitude. 
Now, I think probably here this is a different group than the first group. And so perhaps it's under, to be understood as now it's the voice of everybody, right? The servants in heaven, the servants on earth, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, all of them joining together in worship. The sound of it is much like the sound that we've, or is described in ways that we've seen before. It's like the sound of mighty waters, like the sound of many th of mighty thunder peals. And the, the crashing nature, the cascading nature, it's just kind of rolling over you. Right? We've talked about this before, this roaring, crashing. What's reflected here is the power, the majesty of the sound, the loudness. And once again, we have the word hallelujah. Right. In each of these, right, that idea of, of praise the Lord is giving reasons why. Right? Praise the Lord because of his judging and avenging. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for he reigns. Right? For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Now, in a sense, obviously, God has been reigning prior to this point. By putting it in the present, God continues to reign. Right? God constantly reigns. But God's reign is now evidenced for those early Christians in the destruction of Babylon. Note the, the words that are used. Right? He is the Lord. What does the Lord, word Lord suggest? Lord, I mean, you think of any Lord, you think of someone who is above all. He's above all things. And what do, what do the words do? Yeah, and so the idea here is, is, is the Lord, the ruler. Right? This is the one who is over all. He is God. God in contrast to other gods. Right? And so the singular there, the Lord our God, the Almighty. What's suggested behind Almighty? What does Almighty represent? That omnipotent, that it is, it's to reflect the power of God, right? So he's the ruler, he's the God in contrast to other gods, he is the one who is truly powerful. He reigns. And so, from that, there should be rejoicing, being glad, exulting, and giving him the glory. What does it truly mean when God really rules? Well, it means it's time to rejoice. Right? It's time to be glad. It's time to give God the glory. But there's something else that's connected with this as well. That God is reigning. Babylon has been destroyed. God is reigning. Give him glory, rejoice. It's a time of great celebration because the marriage of the Lamb has come. And so the end of Babylon, the reigning of God, are connected with the marriage of the Lamb. Throughout the Old Testament, the image of God as a husband to Israel is a prominent one, especially throughout the prophets. And so to help the, the people understand what they've done by committing adultery, the prophets are given this message of God being a husband to Israel. And so the unfaithfulness, uh, the spiritual adultery. But also in the New Testament, we have many images related to the, the bride, bridegroom, marriage, right, particularly between... Uh, between Christ. But this phrase, the marriage of the Lamb has come, makes me think of a particular parable in the Gospels. What parable might I be referring to? Okay, so one we could would look at would be the, the parable of the, the ten bridesmaids or ten virgins, depending on your translation. Right? So the bride, bridegroom is delaying, and so they fall asleep when they wake up. They need to trim their, 
their lamps, but only the five wives have brought enough oil, and the five foolish have to go away, the bridegroom comes. What other parables might relate here as well? The parable of the wedding feast, right? Because a king is holding a wedding feast for his son, at least in Matthew's account, this is slightly different in, in Luke's, uh, calls to the people that have been invited. What's the response of the people that have been invited? Yeah, they come up with all sorts of excuses. And Luke, Luke's par- in Luke's version, Jesus talks about the excuses, right? And bought, bought some land and needed to go look at it. Who looks at it? Who buys land without looking at it? All right, I got some oxen. I got to try it out. I'm going to buy this car, but I'm not going to have, hey, you know, I'm not going to test drive it. I'm not going to check under the hood and make sure there's an engine. Right? Who buys oxen without testing it out? Right? So this, the excuses are flimsy, but everybody has a reason why they don't come. And so the king sends out his servants to bring the, the poor, the destitute, the, the orphans, the lame, right, into the wedding feast. And so this great marriage uh, the world is called to related to God's deliverance and it's kind of what re- was reflected here. And so the marriage of the Lamb has come. So great joy, happiness. Additionally, the bride has made herself ready. Now, who's the bride of the Lamb? The church. And, and Paul, Paul uses that image in Ephesians chapter 5. Christ, uh, the relationship between husband and wife, just like the relationship between Christ and the church. And so the bride is ready. And the bride, which we will see in later chapters, particularly chapter 21, is being made ready. And what she'll be wearing for the marriage is fine linen white or bright and pure. Now, with emphasizing it being bright and pure, we're meant here to contrast it to the prostitute of chapter 17. The church is holy. The prostitute, of course, was a prostitute. Now, here too, when you think about the the difference between how the prostitute is dressed and how the bride is dressed, both of them were said, this is especially in chapter 18, to have fine linen, which as we noted was an expensive uh, expensive material, yet there is a way in which you kind of almost give them the idea that this, the way the bride is uh, adorned is expensively, but simply. Right? We don't see the, the purple, the scarlet, the jewels, uh, the gold, right? it's the fine linen, bright and pure. Of course, meant to evoke the idea of wedding clothes, which is ultimately coming from God. right? It, it has been granted to her. But lest we misunderstand what the symbolism is, we're told, what does the fine linen represent? The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So again, kind of this emphasis on on purity, on faithfulness, in contrast to the immorality of the prostitute. Now, in a sense, what we see here is the idea that as the saints, right, and remember, for the New Testament, the term saint refers to all Christians. Right? It's not a specialized group, as, as some uh, groups use it. Right? It refers to all Christians. If you're a Christian, living faithfully, you're a saint. And so as the saints, as Christians live pure lives, the church is pure. And that's what's reflected here, because you have the singular collective, the bride. But the bride's clothing is the righteous deeds of the saints. Right? And so there's the collective and the individual. So there's the collective view of this, the purity of the church, but sh- the church is pure as individual lives, as individual Christians live pure lives. 